Well, if you know me, you know that the past few weeks, I have been in an absolute emotional chokehold by a specific Netflix show. <laughs> Deep on the banks of North Carolina, <laughs> Sarah Cameron continues to break my heart. I am absolutely emotionally invested into the show Outer Banks, so much so that I, I don't like spread it out in 10 days. I watch it all in one day. It just consumes me. Um, but as I was thinking about this night and watching those shows, which isn't a good preparation tactic, I was thinking about family, and then I realized something. The show is full of interruptions. You can't make it five minutes without something coming in, and you're going, what the heck? No, they were so close. And 70, I would say 75% of the interruptions are, aren't, well, some of them are relationship interruptions, which if it's JJ and Kiara, I'm all for it. But most of the interruptions are family stuff. That as they're pursuing the treasure, what gets in their way? Their family. Sarah Cameron's parents are manipulative and crazy, to say the least. John B's parents are absent, or are they? JJ's parents, abusive. Pope's parents look, want the best for him but set high expectations. Kiara's parents, helicopter parents. And as they're journeying through their pursuit to find this treasure, each of them continue to run into problems with their family. And they're presented kind of two options. They can either run from their family, they can replicate the problems, or they can face it in order to go forward. Now, why mention that? Why do I mention Outer Banks? Because who you are is shaped by where you come from. There's a direct line of sight from your past to your present. That you're a product of your upbringing. Where you are right now is affected by your upbringing. That I did math and it's not crazy math. If we're all 18 to 25 year old in here, which maybe some people are sneaking in a little bit over, that means 75 to 95% of our life, if not more, has been around our family that our households have been the main force that has shaped us. Pete Scazzaro, who's a great writer, says, numerous external forces may shape us, but the family we have grown up in is the primary and most powerful system that will shape and influence who you are. What is the primary and most powerful system that influences who you are right now? Your family. And some of you are like, what? No, no, my family doesn't get to define me. I get to define myself. I get to go out and prove myself. I go follow my dreams. And then that's who I am. And, and yes, that's what modern secularism screams. It, it, it's hyper-individualistic. It says you go to find yourself. And, and that's the narrative that's presented in all art and all movies and all songs. But we still say things like, like father, like, like mother, like the apple does not fall far from the tree. We still say those things. Why? Because family is the most powerful influence on our lives. And the presence of sin has entered the fabric of our family. And so that means the thing that has the most influence on our lives has been corrupted and has sin intertwined into it. That doesn't mean, now let me just say, the, the point of this talk tonight is not to say, I hate families. I think this is an awesome, awful, Invention. I'm not saying that. I'm pro-family. I'm all for family. My family would listen to this and they would kill me if not. But what I'm saying is they're most influential and the dysfunctions in your family have drastic effects on you. And they leave you with a decision. You can either run, you can replicate those problems, or you can face them. Tracy Chapman wrote one of the biggest bangers of the 90s. And she wrote about an alcoholic father and an absent mother. And she says, you got a fast car. Is it fast enough so we can fly away? We gotta make a decision. Leave tonight or live and die this way. She says, I see that problem and I don't wanna replicate it so I'm gonna run. But what I wanna talk about tonight is there, there's another way. There's another way to deal with the dysfunction of your family. And we see it in the story of Jacob. We see Jacob is the third generation of God's chosen family. 
God came to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, and said, I am going to save the world through you. I'm gonna give you land, I'm gonna give you family, and I'm gonna bless it. I'm gonna save the world. The world's way back to the garden is through you. And it's through this chosen family that Jacob comes through. But guess what? If you read Genesis as part of your Bible plan this year, you realize these are not great examples to follow. These men got wives, uh, plural. <laughs> these twins got tension. It, it, it's, it's all disordered. It's all dysfunctional. And how does Jacob deal with the dysfunction of his past? How does he move forward? How is he not stopped by his past? Well, he revisits his, he revisits his past and he wrestles with God. Well, see, that's the different way. If you can run from those problems or you can replicate those problems, there's a different way where you can revisit your past with God Almighty and you can wrestle with them. And there, only there, can you find redemption in the biggest of hearts, in the hardest of challenges, in the toughest of family situations, can you find redemption in your family? So what I'm gonna do uh, is do a quick flyover, flyover of Jacob's childhood and uh, his upbringing. But before I do that, some of you who know the Bible well are saying, aren't wrong, your whole thesis of this talk is wrong. Because Philippians 4.13 says, there is one thing must I do. Forget what lies behind and press on towards what goes ahead. So are we supposed to forget about everything that's happened to us? Are we supposed to forget about the most influential system on us? That's not what Paul's talking about. He's not saying you shouldn't forget all the things done to you, by you, and around you. He's, what he's saying there is context is I, Jesus Christ is so worthy that he's willing to forget all the riches that I had before. He's not saying there's no purpose in revisiting your past. Does that make sense? I just wanted to do that disclaimer. Uh, so let's do an arc of Jacob's upbringing. We see he comes out of the womb in conflict. That as soon as Jacob comes out of the womb, he's grabbing his brother's heel. Uh, and they look at him and say, we're gonna call you heel grabber, which isn't a good start. Hey, heel grabber, go grab some cookies. No, and, the, and then it's a Hebrew pun for deceiver. That would be like in the 21st century, naming your kid problematic. <laughs> he is not set up for success. And then he grows up and he's contrary uh, to his brother. This is like, this isn't like those identical twins that you knew in middle school that wore the same outfit every day and their names were Jeffrey and Jeremy and you couldn't tell them apart and their hair parts were the same. They, this is the polar, this is worse than Drake and Josh. These boys are absolutely opposite. Esau is a man's man. He's outdoors, he's a hunter, he's violent, he's impulsive, he's impetuous, he's shallow. Girls are like, yes, shallow. <laughs> Jacob, on the other hand, was a man of the tents. He was what we would call an indoors kid. You never wanted to be called an indoors kid. He was cooking with his mom. He did not have a good rep with the boys on the street. And then in that tension, Jacob learns to be conniving. That one day, his sensual, manly man brother comes in from hunting and says, need some soup or I'm gonna die. Proof that men can be dramatic. And Jacob goes, here, great idea. Give me your... Uh, Give me your birthright. Sell me your identity for a cup of soup. And Esau says, sure. And Jacob just steals his birthright. This is the first recorded identity theft ever. <laughs> but then it's not just between the brothers. You also see the tensions up with the parents. That you read, you, you read that the parents play favorites. That Isaac, their, their father, it says he loves Esau. He, he saw the manly man and he say, I see myself in that. I love that. And it says, Rebecca loved Jacob. And when a, when, a, when, a boy does not, when a boy does not feel the love of a father, he'll spend the rest of his life looking for it. And so Jacob grows up with every day, dad comes in the door, and who does he look at? Not Jacob, Esau. That's the boy I love. And so the parents play favorites. And then it's an even a layer deeper. There's generational habits that trickle down three generations. Abraham. The grandfather who God came to, he develops a habit of lying to find favor with men. That uh, at one moment he's, he's in kind of opposing territory 
And in order to find favor with the king in a distant land, he says, they said, is that your wife? He goes, no, 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 that's my sister. Not a good, not a good idea. But then years later, you have Isaac, his son. He's in a distant land trying to find favor with the king. Looks at his wife. That's my sister. And then you have Jacob. What is Jacob's big screw up? He steals the blessing. He's the deceiver. It's almost like the apple does not fall far from the tree. Because in the culminating moment of Jacob's upbringing, what happens? Uh, Isaac is growing sick and his eyes are his eyes are going out and he calls his son Esau, the other twin, and says, now is the time for me to pass on the inher inheritance and bless. Uh, in that time, you would typically only bless one son because if you divided your wealth, uh, then you kind of lose generational wealth. Does that make sense? So you would typically give a main blessing uh, to one son. And so he calls Esau and he says, it's time for the blessing, it's time to pass on the inheritance. And Jacob's mom is in the kitchen and she hears what's going on. And she says, Jacob, now's the time. And so Jacob dresses up like a hairy Ed Sheeran <laughs> and comes to his father with a bowl of soup and his father's expecting Esau. He says, my son, is that you? He said, yes, father, I'm ready for the blessing. And then Isaac realizes the voice is off and says, wait, who are you? And he reaches out his arms, the father touches the arms, smells them, feels like Esau, smells like Esau, has the soup that Esau would present. And what does Jacob say? I'm Esau. The lying was not just in that moment. It was years upon years, generations upon generations that led to this blow up moment where Jacob lied to steal the blessing of his father. That uh, it's almost like sin has layers, that it's way deeper. And so when you look at the big picture of this family, you see favoritism, you see fighting, you see lying, you see generational habits, you see cursing, you see name calling, you see pride, manipulation. Is it starting to sound like your Thanksgiving table yet? Because our sin is a lot bigger than just a few decisions we've made over time. When you think about your sin, it's not like points on a plot graph. It's more like a giant knot inside of you. That there's been sin done to you. There's been sin done by you. And there's been sin done around you that has formed a great big knot in you. And so you don't say, I'm a sinner because I messed up in third grade. You say I'm a sinner because there's this giant knot in me and I don't know what's wrong. That sin's been done to me, by me, and around me. And uh, the roots of family dysfunction go deeper than I realized. And so maybe you've inherited some things. Uh, psychologists say uh, predispositions to certain things pass through certain generations. And for you, they may be addictions, anxiousness, maybe bipolar tendencies, maybe pride or judgment, uh, maybe outlashing anger, maybe mood swings, maybe depression. That kind of trickles through my family, but my family just says, oh, it's just the bar family funk. <laughs> the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Now, modern psychologists would call this generational effect, they would say, that's genetics, or some would say that's the result of epigenetics, of trauma falling through. Our Pentecostal brothers and sisters would say, boy, that's a generational curse. Is it this? Yes, probably in some aspect. Is it this? Yes, probably in some aspect. Is there something going on genetically? Yes. Is there something going on spiritually? Yes. But generations affect where you are today. And if you are where you come from, then it's not just your parents in, in your bedroom going up, it's the people that came before them. And then you, maybe, you might have started things because of specific situations in your life. Sin may have entered your life because of certain things that happened to you when you were young or recently. Uh, maybe you had helicopter parents who watched every movie made. And so now you're tense in every situation. Maybe you had crazy expectations set on you. You had a perfectionist house, household. And so that caused you to 
go off in rebellion. And now you live miles away from your family because you, you could never live up to their expectations. Uh, maybe you had the absence of a parent and maybe you filled the role of a parent. Maybe, maybe you had the absence of a father who never said I love you. Maybe you had the absence of a mother who cared about the little things in your life. Maybe you had siblings who fought with you all the time. Maybe you had a sibling who everyone looked at and hailed. Maybe you had abuse done to you by your siblings or by your parent. Maybe you went through a traumatic situation. All of these things form a knot in us. And when we survey our lives right now, we realized, oh, I'm impacted by all of this past. Maybe you inflicted sin into your family. Uh, that's, that, I can point back to many cases of things that I learned in middle school and brought to my dinner table, and that never ended well. Uh, that in a way, we've inflicted sin into the system. And so what I'm saying is there's been sin done to you, by you, and around you. Uh, and often, if you feel paralyzed, if you feel constrained in your calling on your life, if you feel stuck where you are, it may not be a now problem. It may be a problem that all of this stuff has formed me. That the things I've inherited, the things I've done because of certain situations, the things that I've brought into my family, uh, it's all created a huge dysfunction and a huge entanglement. Now question, am I trying to play the blame game? Am I trying to say that all of these things are your family's fault? That the reason you rebelled or the reason you've made the mistakes or your family's fault. No, I'm not saying that. Because Isaiah 53, 6 says, each man has turned in his own way. That we're all guilty for the sin done by us. Am I trying to say you're guilty for the sin done to you? Am I trying to say you're to blame for the abuse? No, please don't hear that. Uh, Ezekiel 18, 20, the son will not share the guilt of the father. Uh, what I'm trying to say is it's all more tangled than we realize. And rather than settling for playing victim with all this, rather than settling for saying, this is just how I was raised, this is how I am, I just want to present to us another way. Uh, I, I go to a comedy club in Washington, D.C. often, and it's not a Christian comedy club, so I can't recommend it, but uh, I go to see, you know, the functions of the world. And... Uh, and, and laugh, but um, uh, one thing that's so interesting is, uh, yeah, there are no Christian comedians, and, uh, and they, uh, I'm not kidding, more than half of the people go up there and say, I struggle with depression because my parents did, and then people in the crowd clap, like standing ovation, and then another person goes, I hate my body because my dad da -da 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 -da, shamed me growing up and all these things. And then it's a, like there's an applause. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, whoa. Is, is all of the suffering, is all of the pain in their life just for them to stand there and play victim? And so people can clap at them and say, yeah, life's hard for you and you don't need to change. Or is there another way? Is there another way where you can find redemption in the deepest hurts, in the biggest dysfunctions of your family, in the hardest of paths? Is there a way? Uh, let's, look at let's get back to Jacob's story. Uh, so Jacob, after he's stolen his brother's blessing, his brother Esau comes home and says, uh, what's happening? And the dad's like, the blessing's been given out. And he goes, what? He is a deceiver. He's lived up to his name. And uh, Esau there says, as soon as my dad dies, I'm going to go kill my brother. And so Jacob runs for his life. And so he's running across the desert alone. And it's in that moment when he's in the desert alone that God meets him. And this is the first encounter that Jacob's had with God. And you get this epic scene. It's the OG stairway to heaven. It's the, it's the Jacob's ladder. Jacob gets a dream and a picture of heaven coming down to earth, and it's magnificent. And you know what Jacob does? People miss this. At the end, he says, 
oh, that's cool. God can help me out too. And he starts making if-thens with God. Because what does he say? He says, if God will be with me and keep me in this way and give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I may come again to my father's house, then the Lord shall be my God. He's saying, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. He starts making if-thens with God. When things get rocky in your life and God is not your God, you'll start making if-thens with him. You'll start partnering with him to get your way. If you're God, then make my whole family situation better. Then I'll bring you into my life. You make him a means to an end. What's your end? It's not God. He's just a partner. What is Jacob doing here? He's treating God like he's treated everyone else in his life. I can deceive you. I can use your power to get me what I really want. And you realize, oh, God, that's not Jacob's God. He was the God of Abraham. He was the God of Isaac. And God, God comes to him in grace and compassion. And Jacob says, I'm not going to make you my God until you fulfill these things. Now, that's not a good approach to meeting God. And it's not probably a good deal to make with God. Uh, and it's not how you're supposed to meet with God. But God has a heart of compassion and mercy. And in his kindness, he grants Jacob's request that God prospers Jacob. That Jacob goes off into a distant land, gets a family. He gets wives, again, problematic. Uh, he gets 11 children, and, and he gets a bunch of wealth. Uh, but you see, there's still dysfunction uh, over there. And, and he has kind of rivalry with his father-in-law and his in-laws. And there's, there's lying, there's deceiving on both sides. And so it, it's, God blesses him and prospers him and gives him a family and says, I'm still with you. But there's still these dysfunctions. There's still the lying. There's still the deceiving. Uh, and then God, 20 years later, comes to Jacob and says, Jacob, it's time to come home. It's time to go home. It's time to go back to your father's house. Now pause. If Jacob's going to go home, what is the one thing that separates him from home? It's Esau. It's, it's his, the antithesis of his whole life. It's his, it's his enemy. It's his anathema. It's everything that he doesn't want to face. He said, this guy, this brother, this twin has stood in front of me and everything that I want in life. And God says, you got to go home, Jacob. What does that mean? He has to face his past problems to reach his future. Uh, and I want you to see the contrast. What you have here is 20 years ago, Jacob left a blown up situation and is running in the desert alone, and he was alone. He had no family, he had no wealth, he had no kids. Here, 20 years later, God has blessed him, and now he's traveling across the desert. What does he have? Family, kids, wealth, cattle. He's coming back a different man. God has come through on his promises, but one thing one thing is very similar from these two journeys. What is it? Fear. I'm running from Esau, and now I'm afraid to death that Esau stands in front of me. And so, so Jacob sends his messengers ahead, and here's Esau has 400 men. My guy does not stand a chance. And then it says, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And so he divided his people that were with him, and the flocks and the herds came, and he was thinking, if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape it. What is he doing? He's living up to his name. There's, there's not an ounce of spontaneous anything in Jacob's life. Everything's deceiving. Everything's scheming. He's saying, okay, I'm going to send these people ahead, but then we're going to bail if he gets them. If things get bad, we're going to bail. So he's still being a deceiver. And then he took them, talking about his family, and sent them across the stream and everything else he had. And Jacob was left alone. 20 years later, he's alone in the desert. And so Jacob sends his family ahead of him, and he's alone. And you expect that he's going in the middle of the night to meet his enemy, the person he's been battling with, wrestling with, struggling with his whole life. Esau's been in the way of the blessing that he really wanted. What did Jacob really want? I wanted the inheritance, I wanted the blessing, I wanted the favor. Who has been in the way of that his whole life? Esau. So he's in the middle of the night. 
expecting Esau, and a man jumps on his back and wrestles with him all night. It's an even match. It's not MMA that I was watching the other night that ended in 15 seconds. This thing goes all night, but it's not Esau. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint. So the fellows are wrestling all night, and they're going at it. What are you taught in third grade PE? What is the most powerful part of your uh, athletic body? Your hips, three-point stance. And these guys have been going at it all night, and the man Jacob's wrestling with reaches over, taps his hip. And Jacob collapses. And it's almost like, though it was an even match, though it seemed Jacob was winning, this man was holding out because he reached over and he touched, and Jacob collapsed. There is only one being in the world who has that kind of power that can touch you and all the power go out. And so what does Jacob do? He grabs him. He does, what, he does what I did when I was losing to my dad wrestling growing up. My dad would like give me a little, you know, let me win for a little bit. Then he would really, he would really get me. And, uh, and, then, and then I would grab his legs and I just wouldn't let him walk anywhere. I'm like, bro, if you're gonna lose, if I'm gonna lose, you're gonna lose. Neither of us are leaving this room. And Jacob does that, hip out, grabs this man and realizes, oh my gosh, this is the person I've been wrestling with my whole life because there's only one being who can touch my hip and release all the power. Jacob grabs this man and says, this is God and I'm wrestling with God and all of my striving all of life all of my wrestling, all of my problems with my family, all of my frustration with my family, the thing that I was really frustrated with, the thing that I was really angered about, the thing that I was really wrestling with was this man. It all started to make sense to him. And he grabbed hold of him. And he said, and the man says, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. This is the blessing he was looking for his whole life. This was the affirmation of a father that he never heard. This was the kindness of a brother that he had never had. Everything, this was the love of a wife. This was the success of a career. This is everything you're looking for, is seeing the face of God and saying, bless me. I want to find ultimate satisfaction and hope and hunger in your face. And he's grabbing him and he's saying, I won't let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go until you're my God. And then I think, the most, I think the most profound verse of the book of Genesis, God looks at him and says, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Question, when is the last time Jacob was asked his name? Do you know the last time Genesis records Jacob being his name, having his name asked? It's when he was dressed up as Esau. And he's trying to steal the blessing. And his dad says, my son, who is it? What do you say? I'm Esau. 30 years later, this man's wrestling with God. He says, I'm not gonna let you go till you bless me. And God looks at him and says, what's your name? I'm the deceiver. I'm the liar. I'm Jacob. Confession in the face of God always leads to redemption. Where does all of his past, all of his hurt, all of his shaming, this guy was called the deceiver from growing up. He lived up to it, but he was also called that from the womb. Where does all of that hurt? Where does all of the abuse start to make sense? When you're in the face of God and he says, what's your name? And you say, it is me. I am Jacob. And then God says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men 
and have prevailed. He changes his name. He gives him a new identity. Yes, you are shaped. Yes, you are a product of your past. Yes, your family has has the greatest influence on you. But what defines you? What names you? God. How do you prevail over God? I struggled with this. It says, your name's Israel because you've prevailed over God in one. I'm like, who can be God? I mean, it's different. How do you win with God? You win by losing. You win by confessing. How does Jacob win? He confesses, I'm Jacob. And then I love this. Jacob looks at God and says, please tell me your name. And God was probably like, man, you know who you're talking to. I'm the guy you've been wrestling with your whole life. I'm the blessing you were looking for your whole life. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the blessing you've looked for. And so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God to face, face to face, yet my life was delivered. And then the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. This is wonderful. I challenge you to read Genesis uh, when you get a moment. It, this is the, I think this is the most beautiful story ever recorded. Because 30 years ago, when Jacob was running from his family, what does the writer include? It's, it's, it's at the, whenever the stairway to heaven happens, the ladder happens, the writer includes, and the sun was setting. And then 30 years later, God meets him in the desert alone. And what does it say here? The sun rose. What was now dark is light. I once was blind, but now I see. I once treated God like everyone else. Now God is God. Now he's my God. I don't make deals with people. I don't deceive people. I've come to the end of myself and I've found the beginning of God because I've seen his face. How does Jacob find redemption? By revisiting his past and wrestling with God. And there he finds hope. C.S. Lewis says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see that the sun's risen, but because it, by it, I see everything else. The sun's rose. Everything's changed. And then it says he limps for the rest of his life. Limping for the rest of his life is better than being separated from God his whole life. And he realized, walks around with this weakness, walks around with this pain, people may laugh at it. He laughs sarcastically back because he says, this limp? I got this from God. This is how I met God Almighty. This is how I found everything I've been looking for. This is how I found redemption for my past. This is how I found reconciliation and courage with my family. Uh, and, it, and it's beautiful. The story goes on, and the next morning, Jacob wakes up. After he's meeting God, his, his life's changed. The sun has now set in his heart. And he goes, and he wakes up, and Esau's still ahead. God didn't just like in the night while he's wrestling with God, wipe out Esau. Esau's still alive. So problem's still there. Uh, but it is out of that moment with God that he has the courage to face his brother Esau. And it says the next morning they woke up and Esau saw Jacob from a long distance and the two ran towards each other and didn't fight, didn't battle, didn't kill one another. They hugged one another. They fell to the ground and they wept and reconciliation was found from the past. Why? Because Jacob found redemption in God. He found everything he was looking for. One of my friends, I was texting about this talk and uh, I, I was just curious of how do you make sense of all this? And he sent me this quote that helped me make sense of it. And he said, the heritage of sin in our family provides the backdrop needed to remind us of the glory and the beauty of the new birth in Christ, in which we receive a more glorious heritage from our heavenly father that covers over the sinful one from our earthly father. The dysfunction of our family is tough, and I'm sorry about it, and I hate it for you, but it's, it's through that ugly backdrop that you see the gospel, that you see a new family and a new name presented, and you see this is the blessing, this is the thing you were looking for, this is the family you were looking for all along. And when you, 
when you realize the family aspect of the gospel and that you can have a father that has unconditional love for you and you can have a friend that never gives up on you, and you can have brothers and sisters that are always there for you. When you realize this, it doesn't make you run away from that. God never called Jacob to lead his fam- leave his family. He actually called him to revisit him. If you hear anything, then don't hear that, okay, I've, I've joined the heavenly family. I'm a Christian now. Now I can neglect my family. Now I don't have to revisit those things. Now I don't have to reconcile. No, this is the power that moves you back there. So when I find redemption in him, I can move in reconciliation back here. And I have courage to face the biggest of fears and the hardest of forgivenesses. And so what does this mean for us? I'm, I'm gonna name a few things and then I'm gonna get out of here, but uh, what does this mean for us? First, we have to realize that the main problem in everyone's life is that they have been looking for the blessing of God in all the wrong places. Uh, maybe your parent looked for their ultimate satisfaction and their ultimate blessing in you, or maybe you did that with a parent or maybe siblings. Everyone's problem is they've really, they've really been looking for that face in all the wrong places. Second, how do you deal with the dysfunctions of your families? You revisit the past and you wrestle with God. You revisit the past with God. You, you meet with him in prayer and you revisit your past, all those times you don't wanna remember, all those moments that you hate to think about, all of those conversations that you don't wanna have. You, you, br- you bring them to the feet of people you trust. You bring them to the feet of a good God. And then you wrestle with God. That may sound crazy to some people. But God often wrestles you into a transformed life rather than just comforts you and gives you all you want. You'll probably find the purposes of God through wrestling rather than just sitting and waiting for God to bless you. Uh, You say, how do you wrestle? Pray. When? All the time. Pray when you don't want to. Pray when you don't know how to. Nobody on these stages, nobody who works at these churches. No one has a great formula to prayer. All we can do is just come to God and talk with them. Every problem we have, every frustration we have with our family, every thing that we don't wanna remember, you can bring it all to God. There's no formula. You don't have to do A, B, C. Pray, pray, pray. Pray when you don't know how to. Pray when you don't want to. That's how you wrestle with God. And then seek redemption and restoration with God before you try to fix things in your family, before you try to have reconciliation. Get right with God first before you go trying to solve your family. What is the greatest force that can move you back in your family? It's grace. Where do you find grace? At a throne where he is. And when I've met him, when I've encountered him, now I have the power to go back into my family and have those hard conversations. Now I have the power to forgive people who are very hard to forgive. Now I have the power to face things that are really scary. And then lastly, don't despise your limp. Often what it takes is an experience of crippling weakness for us to finally discover the blessing of God. Uh, That's why so many of the most God-blessed, God-filled people limp as they dance. The Christian life is not perfection. It's one of dancing and limping. Uh, He may have brought pain into my life, but it's worth it because I met him. This limp, People may laugh at it, but it brought me to his face and it was worth it. And so I limp and I don't neglect it because it brought me to him. And then lastly, uh, I'll end with this. If if you hear all of this and say, you know, this is really cool. The Jacob story is awesome. Uh, It seems like he had a great experience with God and God met him in the desert when he most needed him or even when he didn't know he needed him. But uh, God's never, I've never experienced anything with God. Like I've never had a night in the desert with God. Maybe you're saying that. Maybe you're saying, well, I hear other people's like testimony stories, but I've never, I've never had that moment. Uh, and matter of fact, as I think about my life, God's nowhere to be found. That when my parents split up, or when one parent had an affair on the other, God was nowhere to be found. In the night that I was praying in my room alone, he, was, he didn't answer. There was nothing. He didn't solve anything. 
Where was God when I was abused? Where was God in all of the dysfunction of my household? Where was God in all of the tension with my siblings? Where was God? Where was God with all the frustrations of my life? Where was he? Where was he when I was wrestling with everyone? Where was God when you needed him most? Where was God when you needed him most? Where was he when you needed him most? Where was he? Where was God when you needed him most? There's a greater Jacob. And that's what we're celebrating because Jesus Christ, he came, he showed up for a wrestling match and he didn't win, he got smoked. Where was God when you needed him most? He went to the ultimate wrestling match because what you and I deserved is judgment. That we're so broken that we have nothing to offer for eternal life. And God showed up for you when you needed him most and went to the wrestling match and got smoked. He got beaten, he got killed. Why? So you could find life. So that you could enter the family you've always longed for. So that you could know the Father your heart has always desired. So that you could find the hope of everything, everything that you've ever been looking for. This is the family that makes perfect sense. He punched heaven through earth and says, come with me from earth into heaven. Come into the family that I'm making. Where was God when you needed him most? He was paying for your sin. He was punching your ticket into the heavenly family. And so we worship that God. Jesus Christ came to bring you, you, yes, I'm talking to you, and to the family of God, to know a father who will never give up on you, who loves you with an unconditional love. He's the brother you've always wanted, that never gives up on you, that goes to fight for you when you can't. And then he gives us the family that we get to spend the rest of life with, that we get to dance with. Do you know that God? In the dark distanglement of your past, do you know that he can take you back there and he can redeem it? And you can find hope in his face and you can see that man and say, that's what I've been looking for all of my life. You're my God. Why is he the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why? Did they do something good for him? No. Because he looked at them and said, I'm committed to you. My heart's after you. Why is God your God? Because you did something good for him? No, because he's looked at you and said, my heart is committed to you. I'm coming after you. Do you know that God? It's an invitation. Let's pray.